Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Chris mentioned, my name is Joanne Keatley. I'm the director of the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health at UCSF. Um, and I want to just extend my appreciation to Christine and the team at the um, AIDS Edu at the Addiction Technology Transfer Center for inviting me to present on this topic today. Um, I am going to uh, be speaking with you for the next uh, hour and a half or so. Um, I'm hoping that I've built in enough time for you to ask questions, so please feel free to ask questions as I go along with uh, the information, and I'll do my best to try to answer those questions. Um, let's see, I guess at this point I should just make sure that everyone is hearing me okay. Is, is, uh, is, does anyone have any issue with my voice? Am I speaking loud enough? Um, yeah, they can answer me either in the chat or in the questions box, and I will forward the information to you if there's any problems. Okay, great. All right, so then let's see. We will go to the presentation itself. So um, today we're going to um, have some objectives, um, and our objectives are um, to understand terms and concepts regarding transgen transgender people's lives and experiences, um, to un identify distinctions between gender identity, sexual orientation, and the importance of those differences in providing care for transgender patients, and to increase participant understanding of issues that are relative to the provision of quality health care services for transgender people. Um, let's see, part of, um, in, in preparation for this uh, talk, I wanted to actually get a sense of who was on the call today and uh, what are your professional roles. So I think at this point I'm going to ask Christine to begin the first polling question. How would you like to see?
Okay, uh, the results of the poll are 81% counselor, therapist, social worker, 7% uh, program or unit managers, and 11% other. So um, okay. I don't know what the other is yet. If you'd like to let us know, please just put it in the, um, the questions box or in the chat, and um, we'll be able to see what that is. So everything is going along great so far, I think. And um, we will close this poll and go on with the, with the lesson. Great. Thank you, everyone, for responding to the poll. It really does help us to understand who else is on the call. So um, let's see. OK, so the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health is, as I already mentioned, at the University of California in San Francisco. And um, what you have in front of you is a slide of um, the team members at the Center of Excellence. I'm going to refer to the Center of Excellence as COE. That's shorthand for our name. And the COE is staffed. Uh, you can see me there with the orange and kind of uh, tangerine colored scarf. That's Joanne. And um, I'm all the way on the, on the left of your screen. And then standing next to me is Jameson Green, a transgender man who is quite uh, um, well known in this country and beyond. And he is the president-elect for the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And then standing next to him is Jay Sebelius, who is our co-principal investigator. And then the young man with a cap on his head and the striped shirt is uh, Yvonne Thomas Guess. And then next to him is Angel Ventura, our program assistant. And then Luis Gutierrez Mock with the glasses. He's a technology exchange specialist. And then Danielle Castro next to him. She's also a technology exchange specialist. And she's the uh, CATCH program coordinator. CATCH stands for the Coalitions in Action for Transgender Community Health. It's one of our CDC-funded projects. And then Greg uh, Repchok, uh, at the, um, standing next to Danielle, is our co-principal investigator for the CDC um, projects that we have. Um, our mission at the COE is to increase access to comprehensive, effective, and affirming health care services for trans and gender variant communities. And primarily, we've been focused on US-based programming. But um, lately, as of the last couple of years, we've been very fortunate in that we've been able to engage in some international work as well. And so we do have um, capacity building assistance programs and technical assistance programs um, that are either US-based or uh, based in international uh, settings. Um, now, we do uh, assure that community perspectives are uh, represented uh, in all of the work that we do by actively engaging with a national advisory board of 12 transgender identified leaders from throughout the United States. And um, I'm not going to go into um, each individual uh, NAB member's uh, past, but I can share with you that uh, we have a very diverse um, advisory board. Um, we have several people on our board who have master's degrees. Uh, and we have one person who has a doctorate and is actually a professor at Columbia University. Uh, and then several people who are engaged in um, work in the transgender community, um, really reaching out and engaging with transgender populations uh, in their local areas. Um, so we're very proud of their involvement and their hands-on participation in um, advising and guiding all of the work of the Center of Excellence. 
So um, I thought that it was it would be important to think about um, what does transgender mean. Um, I think that uh, often a lot of uh, providers and public health officials um, and even members of the trans community itself will have different definitions for the term transgender. And um, it's important to keep in mind that as a word, the, the word transgender has um, not been in existence for a very long time. It's about it's been in use now for about 20 years. Um, and what we use as a definition, as a working definition, is a person whose gender identity or gender expression differs from the sex that was assigned to them at birth. And you might wonder why we would say from the sex that was assigned to them at birth. And uh, the reason that we use that language we're very careful about the language that we use. And um, the reason that we use that language is because, in fact, um, sex is assigned to people at birth with very rudimentary um, kind of processes uh, based on a visual exam of the genitalia at birth. There is a sex that is assigned or listed on a birth certificate. And often, for transgender people, um, the sex that is assigned to them is not congruent with their sense of self or their gender identity. And of course, gender expression is uh, distinct from gender identity because often trans people are not free to express their gender in the way that they identify. Um, sometimes it's as a result of um, social uh, or economic factors such as uh, the workplace where they're uh, employed um, doesn't allow them to fully express their gender or perhaps they're uh, a minor and they don't feel supported by their families and so they're not able to express their gender um, in that way. They may be in uh, the military and are not able to express their gender uh, because of uh, restrictions was placed upon them um, given the, the social situation. So there are many reasons why people whose gender identity may um, be intact might not be able to act on that. And so therefore their gender expression would differ from, this, from their gender identity as well as from their sex assigned at birth. We often at the COE use the shorthand version of the word transgender and transsexual, trans. And I use the word trans to describe you know, all of the ways in which trans people identify themselves. Um, I'm actually um, going to ask uh, Chris to now um, open up the poll for a question about HIV that I'd like to ask the participants. So Chris, if you would please um, open up the poll. Uh, yes, I just put that on the screen. Um, transgender people make up this percentage of people living with HIV in the U.S. Do you feel that it's 5 percent, 10 percent, 35 percent, or 1 percent, or none of the above? So let's see here. Um, Hmm. Very interesting reply so far. We've got 53%. We'll just wait um, another few seconds or so so we can get more replies. Mm -hmm. And while we're waiting for that, in the meantime, people, please, if you have any questions or comments, please put them in at any time during the session, and we will go over them um, during the break. So I don't have any so far, but we really would like your participation. Um, Okay, we have 69% people responding, so I'm going to close the poll now and we'll share the results. Okay, 32% um, of the respondents think that 5% uh, um, 
uh, of the population is transgender. 29% of the replies say that it's 10%. 4% of the replies say that it's 35%. I hope this isn't confusing everybody. 29% um, of the respondents say that it's only 1% of the population. And 7% um, of the people who replied think that it's some number, some number other than what we have above. So you've got a, quite a wide, wide range of, um, of answers here. Great. Thank you, Chris. Did you get so, the, um, you read them? Yeah, no, I got them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's down now. All right. So, um, well, thank you for weighing in there. I think that it, uh, I'm not surprised with the, um, with the wide range of uh, responses. And the reason that I'm not surprised is that actually um, for um, as long as the, there have been tracking of HIV and AIDS cases in the United States up until last year, excuse me, we had very inaccurate uh, national estimates due to the poor data collection methods that had been implemented um, by health departments and by the Centers for Disease Control and by any of the organizations that were tracking HIV rates. Um, the data that we do have is based on uh, regional studies that have relied almost exclusively on convenience samples. So for example, participants who were recruited from either medical and or social service agencies, so often, you know, at Ryan White care settings, perhaps, or at um, bars where trans and other sexual minority uh, populations might uh, frequent, and or from the street where there would be um, large numbers of trans people who might be engaging in sex work, for example. Um, and so the, those comedian samples are not necessarily reflective of the overall population at large and um, are certainly um, you know, a, a small segment of the population. They also um, have uh, predominantly uh, focused uh, primarily on trans women. Um, and so we have uh, very little information of, that has been available on trans men. Um, however, of the studies that we do have available, we have not seen corresponding high incidence uh, of HIV in trans men uh, in public health settings. So there have been a handful of studies that, in, that have included co data collection um, that was inclusive of trans men. For example, there was um, a, a statewide uh, needs assessment conducted in Virginia that included trans men. There was a large study in San Francisco um, that is about a, now about 12 years old, but uh, Kristen Clements Knoll did an epidemiologic study in San Francisco that included over 100 trans men. And then um, there have been, you know, some smaller uh, studies that uh, have been conducted in uh, New York City and other places. And we, we have not yet to see the corresponding high incidence of HIV among trans men, not in the same degree that we see it among trans women. Um, so what we do have is um, there was a um, meta-analysis that was conducted at the Centers for Disease Control by Jeff Hertz and all. Um, that meta-analysis uh, looked at 29 different studies that had been uh, in the literature. And what they were able to demonstrate uh, in this meta-analysis is that when the results were lab confirmed, that what we ended up with was uh, average prevalence of 28% when there was lab confirmation of HIV results. Now, the same meta-analysis, some of the studies that were reported um, reported HIV by self-report. So what 
that data showed is that when you ask trans people about their HIV status, the average was 12% um, prevalence. And what that says to me and what we've concluded is that we are not actually um, providing an adequate or competent job of reaching and testing transgender women. Um, we, we need to, to actually do a much better job of reaching, testing, and then linking trans people into care. Um, because uh, it's clear that there's a disconnect between uh, lab confirmation and self-reported um, HIV status. The other thing that it tells me is that there's a lot of trans people, trans women particularly, uh, walking around not knowing um, their HIV status. They may be thinking that they're negative when they're not. Um, or they may be avoiding uh, testing situations because they don't feel that there are adequate pro uh, programs to respond to their HIV status should they be um, found to be positive. Um, now, the other thing that emerged from this data is that among African American trans women, they had the highest prevalence, or 56%, compared to other racial and ethnic groups. And so, you know, that is uh, that is quite a number, and I think that it really is, uh, you know, uh, an area that I would consider a public health failure in the United States, that uh, any group would have that high of an HIV prevalence. It's just really almost unacceptable. Well, it is unacceptable. Um, so we need, we need to do a much better job of reaching these women and then uh, testing and then engaging with them and then really linking them to the um, care and services that they need. Um, this data, by the way, I should point out that um, I'm going to go back to this previous slide. I should point out that in um, when the CDC, uh, up until 2011, the CDC uh, did track uh, the data among trans people um, in a way that really didn't fully capture trans identities. In other words, for trans women, uh, the data was collapsed into the MSM risk category, uh, depending on kind of the, you know, the, the genitalia and the behavior that trans women were engaging in, in order to capture their risk group. And so, um, for that's another uh, factor to consider, you know, why we have so few studies and why so many trans women uh, don't know their status is if you have, you know, to uh, self-identify as a risk group that didn't speak to who you were, then, you know, the chances of you being, uh, of you testing are uh, impacted. So, um, the CDC now has um, issued some surveillance reports that are very interesting to, to look at. So uh, this is from the um, 20, 2011 uh, surveillance report, and it is reporting data from 2008 and 9, respectively. So the highest newly identified confirmed HIV positivity was found among transgender persons in 2008 and 9. 2.4 and 2.6 percent, respectively. And then among African Americans, the rates were 4.5 and 4.4 percent, respectively. Now this is um, the highest of any group at risk for HIV in the country, um, including MSM. And then Hispanics, 2.7 and 2.5 percent, respectively. Now, um, this, this next slide here uh, really highlights uh, the, the issue. So this is based on all 
uh, CDC funded testing sites. Okay? And the one thing that the CDC did here that I am not in complete agreement with, actually I'm not in agreement with, I think that um, if, if I had done, if I had been reporting on this data, I would have broken it out by trans men and trans women because I think it would have really given us um, more um, clarity around um, what the numbers mean. But uh, you can see here that uh, on the left, I've uh, put on this table ethnic groups. So black and African Americans, Hispanics, whites, American Indian, or Alaskan Native. And so this category here is highest newly identified confirmed HIV positivity by race. And then um, on your right, you can see that I've broken it out by gender. And these are the genders that the CDC reports on now. And they didn't used to do this. So this is new to this surveillance report. So but now they have male, female, and then transgender all lumped together, trans men, trans women. But um, you can see here that when you go down the ethnic breakdown um, for transgender data in 2008 and 9 are those numbers that I referred to earlier. And you can compare with other genders here. Uh, so for example, transgender people in 2008 had 4.5% positivity rates versus 1.2% in African American males, um, and et cetera. So Hispanic uh, transgender women in 2008 had a 2.7% um, positivity rate versus a 1.1 percent for Hispanic males, etc. So you can see the the huge um, variance in the trans data compared to other genders and um, and by ethnic groups. Now, one of the ways that um, the COE is hoping to make uh, a difference in how the data is reported and, um, and capturing that data and then coming up with something that is really useful for us in applications uh, that are in the public health sector is by actually uh, coming up with a method for capturing uh, gender identity uh, in a way that uh, respects the person's uh, gender identity and also recognizes the sex that was assigned to them at birth so that uh, you can, you know, allow people to self-identify in a way that's meaningful to them, but also you can capture the information that is going to make it easier for you to respond to their public health needs. So we do have at the COE website uh, www.transhealth.ucsf.edu the following recommendations for trans inclusive data collection and this is an abridged version of those questions so we uh, feel that it is important to first ac accurately capture the uh, person's current gender identity and you can do that in a number of ways. You can ask an open-ended question. You can, add, you can have a drop-down menu with some options such as male, female, transgender woman, transgender man. You can, um, you know, some people use um, the male to female uh, and then abbreviate it M to F. Some people use uh, female to male and abbreviate it F to M. The important thing is, um, you know, to have options for people to either self-select or an open-ended question that allows them to self-identify. And then to have a follow-up question uh, with what was the sex that was assigned to you at birth, you can also tweak that question a little bit 
as long as you're capturing the information in a way that's meaningful. So, for example, some people uh, have said that it's a, you know that they're embarrassed to ask this question to someone who is obviously presenting themselves as female and wants to have their gender identity honored. So you can ask about what sex was on their birth certificate is another way to get the same information. And it will tell you if there is uh, incongruence between their current gender identity and the sex that was assigned to them at birth or is listed on their birth certificate. And that's the important thing is to cap capture the incongruence and then also to understand in terms of uh, de defining and designing and then developing and delivering care for this population is that you need to understand if the person before you, you know, um, has certain genitalia, certain health conditions that you need to be watchful of or mindful of. Um, you need to understand, you know, how you're going to provide services for this um, either male or female bodied person um, and, you know, their identity. So the good news is that the CDC actually has now uh, listened to our advice and um, they are, uh, they have updated uh, certain uh, case report forms as well as surveillance uh, sites. And so, for example, this is from uh, core HIV surveillance methods um, from the CDC, and it's an adult HIV case report form, KCRF. And you will see here that this form now gives you the option, and I'm using my cursor, I hope you can see my cursor, um, sex assigned at birth um, here. And so, uh, it has male, and it has female, and it has unknown. Now, you should keep in mind that actually um, for all births in, um, in the U.S. and actually throughout the world, um, birth certificates have two, sale, two sex options, even if a person has um, what is considered a disorder of sexual development or an intersex condition. Typically, people who have an intersex condition will still have had a sex assigned at birth. And so their birth certificate will say male or female, even if they're intersex. Um, and then you'll see here in the, let's see here, in this, um, line here that they ask the current gender identity. And it gives you here some options that the CDC has included. So male, female, transgender male to female, transgender female to male, unknown or additional gender identity. And you know, these are um, in line with what our recommendations are. So we um, really feel like this is a great step forward for the CDC and will uh, hopefully, um, as a result of this revision, which you can see down here, uh, it was revised 6 2011. So this is a historic change to the way the CDC captures this data. Now, this is another form from the CDC, or um, this is actually a screenshot from the CDC. So this is the eHARS data entry screen, and it shows um, a sex assigned at birth. So you can see here, they have it abbreviated here, sex at birth, and then the options are male and uh, female. Yeah. And then you can see that there's another screen here, and then they have the current gender identity, and then the options of male, female, transgender male to female, transgender female to male. 
additional gender identity and not known. So this um, is another way in which the CDC is um, moving forward in collecting this data in a way that will um, tell us a lot more about uh, trans people in this country and um, the issues that they're experiencing. So you can see that you know there's a whole range of information that is also being collected here in terms of um, person demographics and uh, race, uh, et cetera, and then age of diagnosis of AIDS, et cetera. So I think um, I personally can't wait until we get this data because I think it will really clarify lots of um, unanswered questions. And I think that as a result of you know some of this data collection methods, um, that uh, we won't have the kind of the range uh, of responses that we had when we just uh, took our online poll of uh, what your perceptions of um, estimates for HIV prevalence among transgender populations were. So this is uh, another um, slide that I borrowed from the CDC. I want to really, you know, give a shout out to the Centers for Disease Control for making these slides available. They presented them at the World Professional Association for Transgender Health um, meeting in Atlanta, Georgia, and they were kind enough to let me use some of the slides. So I really want to acknowledge the work of Holly Clark and her team at the Centers for Disease Control in sharing this information. But um, this slide is a very interesting one in that it compares um, on the, I hope you can see my cursor, but um, on this two slides here, it shows um, a one-step method of data collection. So this has uh, the total N, 283,000. 597 people, and then here you can see it's the same data set, and the way that it was broken down. This is the old way of uh, collecting the data. So only giving people options of trans M to F, trans F to M. Okay? Now, using the two-step model, what they were able to demonstrate is So this is the old method. So you can see here that is um, 1,170 is the total number of trans people captured out of this 283,597. And then by using the two-step model, they are able to capture these numbers which are trans women, okay? And so then you can see that that is 1,346 trans women. You, this is the same data set, but now breaking it out with a two-step model. And in addition to the 1,346 trans women uh, that were identified, they were also able to capture Five hundred and seventy-one trans men. Um, so, when you add the thirteen hundred and forty-six and the five hundred and seventy-one trans men, you end up with basically a sixty-four percent increase in the data that you're capturing that is clearly trans-identified people uh, out of this two hundred and eighty-three thousand five hundred and ninety-seven data set. So I hope that's clear. 64% um, increase in you know being able to identify uh, trans individuals out of this data set. So um, I wanted to spend a few moments uh, now speaking about um, substance use, since this is the ATTC after all. Um, so I did want to share with you that um, 
first of all, substance use um, is prevalent among uh, you know all sexual minority populations, but certainly among transgender people. Um, and uh, substances are um, have been reported in the literature uh, in almost all of the studies that uh, have been conducted to date, uh, certainly around HIV. Um, and you know why? You might ask yourself, why would that be the case? Why is substance use so prevalent among transgender people? And I would answer that uh, one of the reasons why substances uh, are used so often by transgender people is that they are uh, attempting to cope with, uh, you know, with a social environment that is, uh, you know, often uh, very hard to cope with. Um, so they turn to alcohol and drugs for dealing with issues of poverty, with issues of discrimination, with issues of societal bias, with rejection from their families, you know, the inability to obtain meaningful employment, the inability to maintain meaningful relationships, uh, rejection by family and, and friends and peers, loss of loved ones, loss of family, all of those issues um, impact transgender people and they often turn to alcohol and or drugs in order to better cope with the, um, you know, with the, their social reality. And so what we see is um, high rates of IVU, for example, uh, being reported in a number of, store of studies ranging from 2 to 40 percent. You can see the, the data here. Um, and you can also see that trans people um, also um, use methamphetamine um, in a number of the studies that have been reported. Um, now, why do people use methamphetamine? Um, for a number of reasons. Uh, trans women depend on things like methamphetamine and other stimulants in order to be able to maintain uh, slim bodies. Uh, why would you know they want to maintain slim bodies? Uh, you know, it makes it easier to engage in sex work if you are um, presenting yourself in a in a way that um, you know you look attractive as a female and you're able to attract um, your paying customers. Um, and so um, if you can maintain that body, you're going to have a greater um, response from your male sex clients and you're going to be able to support yourself. You're going to be uh, engaged in uh, a profession that, you know, by all accounts will provide you with at least uh, a means to pay for rent, to have access to, um, to uh, food and shelter and clothing, etc., and maybe even pay for some of your um, transition-related costs. So, um, so methamphetamine and other substances are, are in fact used uh, widely in trans communities. And as I said, for a variety of reasons, it's not merely recreational. Oftentimes, it's situational, and uh, it's a matter of being able to compete in the marketplace as well. These slides um, serve to kind of demonstrate um, the relationship between the stigma and discrimination. And, uh, you know, we've spoken um, already about um, some of the um, outcomes as a result of the stigma and discrimination leading to the loss of family, friends, and, uh, and or employment, and that leading to um, greater rates of suicidality and certainly um, depression among transgender people. And then we have started speaking already about sex work 
um, which I actually equate sex work often to what I call survival sex. Um, often trans people are denied opportunities for education, for employment, for job training, um, because of organizational stigma, discrimination, biases, um, the lack of formal policies in the workplace, a lack of legal protection, um, a lack of um, the support from families to stay at home and finish your education, or, you know, the, um, the, the drive to affirm your sense of self, and as a result of that drive, that very real, you know, driver in many trans people having their, affirming their gender identity as being the most important thing in order for them to be able to move on with their lives, um, leads to, um, you know, this phenomenon where uh, many trans people are ill-prepared to function in the workplace, and so therefore they're forced into a sex work environment. Um, oftentimes it begins innocently enough with a youth or someone in their early adulthood um, exchanging their, their body for either affirmation or for a place to stay, or for something to eat, and then build on that experience. And um, often trans women are then left with sex work as one of the only options for them to be able to survive and affirm their sense of self. And then as a result of the dependence on sex work, um, and often they turn to alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism for dealing with sex work environment where they you know, maybe have not reconciled that. Um, and then that leads to a greater uh, risk for HIV, both through their clients and also through their primary partners who often are engaged in high-risk sexual activity themselves. Um, many trans women partner with um, active drug users, and some of the partners of trans women who are sex workers um, are also engaged in sex work with other men who have sex with men. And so there, you know, an increased risk for uh, HIV, both from their clients who often will pay for engaging in sex uh, practices, sex exchanges with, um, with the transgender sex worker with no uh, protection or um, with their primary partners um, who they often don't rely on condom use with. And then of course, as I've uh, tried to um, argue that as a result of, you know, the stress from the stigma, the discrimination, and the sex work leading to the higher use of substances um, and then the mental health and self-esteem issues that result of some of that substance use and all of the negative inputs, um, that leads to higher incidence of mental health issues, and certainly self-esteem issues. And then the increased risk for HIV. So we can, we've seen in, uh, in the literature that trans ID uh, users are three times more likely to be HIV positive than non-ID users. And then, of course, the increased sexual risk. Now, this is another issue that um, is really impacting um, 
Well, let me let me go back. I, maybe Christine, we could uh, open up to see if there are any questions so far um, from uh, from the um, audience, uh, just so that uh, we have uh, given them an opportunity to ask questions of the information shared so far. I do have a couple. I have a couple people with their hands raised, and then I have a couple people who typed in questions. Um, we'll just do the one typed in question first because I think it'll be a real short answer. They just uh, joined late and wanted you to please just define the term um, like a trans woman and trans man. Okay. So, you know, I could certainly um, direct them back to um, that. Um, I think it was the third or fourth slide where I have a trans, uh, the definition for transgender. The trans women are what uh, is often referred to as male to female. So people who had a male sex assigned to them at birth and now identify as female. And I refer to uh, that part of our population as trans women. And um, trans men are, or trans men, are individuals who were assigned female at birth and now identify as male or something along you know, the male uh, kind of spectrum of identity. And, um, and I refer to them as uh, trans men. Now, some people do refer to those individuals as female to males. So F to M is another kind of acronym that is used. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. And um, at this time, um, uh, an attendee would like to ask you a question. So, Christine, I'm going to unmute your phone. And um, could you please speak? I hope we can hear you. Yes, I can. Yes, good. We can hear you. Please ask your question and make your comments, please. When you were talking about the military and transgender, I deny there are three reasons for that. One is uh, possibility of morale issue. Possibility of what? Morale. Okay. It is like uh, it is like how uh, gay people uh, were treated in the military, and that is where you know I guess example for morale. The second one is undeployable. That means uh, sent overseas. And the last one is the possibility of medication may not be available, such as uh, being in the battlefield. So I just mm -hmm. want to point those three reasons. Uh, military denies uh, transgender. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, thank you for that. Um, I, you know, I didn't really go into, you know, what the reasons might be for um, for trans people either participating or not participating in the military. But um, we know that, in fact, lots of people who have served in the military and are veterans then uh, transition post-military service. And uh, I can share with you that the VA is actually now in the process of developing very clear guidelines around provision of care for transgender uh, veteran Americans. And um, so, you know, we know that trans people have, um, have, you know, given up themselves for this country and have participated in the military. And, um, you know, my hope is that at some point there will be, you know, kind of greater support mechanisms for trans people to serve openly in the military, just as uh, gays and lesbians are now being allowed to do. But we'll see. It's a it's a process. And um, thank you for making those points, Christine. Okay, I have another one other question. In the substance abuse program, how do you identify a transgender person on a demographic report? Um, I think I really went into that in terms of the data collection recommendations. So um, 
the data collection recommendations are on our website. It's very clear, um, you know, step-by-step -step guidance. Um, I would invite you to go to our website, transhealth.ucsf.edu, and look at our data collection recommendations. Um, and then, now, in terms of identifying whether a person is trans, I think the data collection recommendations make sense. That will tell you if the person self-identifies as something that is other than the sex that was assigned to them at birth. Now, the other, you know, I think the question that you haven't yet asked, and uh, maybe is a question that you might want to consider, is um, once you determine the, the gender identity of the person that is being intake at the substance abuse treatment center, then how are you going to house the person? And then how are you going to adequately plan for the services that they are presenting for? So I think, you know, it's, it can be challenging. And I, I don't want to downplay the challenges. For example, in some uh, therapeutic communities, there is a requirement for urinalysis. And the urinalysis is often carried out by a member of the same sex. Um, that is a counselor at the therapeutic community. So, you know, it may be challenging to come up with a policy that it fully honors the uh, client's gender identity, but then also uh, responds to the anatomical realities. If the person is a trans woman, identifies as female, has a uh, female gender expression, but still has a penis, then you know, you're going to have to come up with a, a, you know, a policy and a, and a method that still honors her sense of self, honors her identity, and, uh, and still allows you to capture, uh, and the ca to capture the urine in order to conduct the urinalysis. It might be part of your program. Um, I, I think those policies are best made at the local level, um, and with lots of education and support for the staff that will be required to carry them out. Does that make sense? I hope. <laughs> um, yes, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I have a couple um, more comments here. Uh, let's see. Male to female transgender are um, more resistant to stop using illegal drugs than female to male transgenders. This is, is a, a comment, and the. Um, so I don't well, know I how do you feel about that. Do you feel that that's a correct uh -huh. statement? Uh huh. Um, you know, I I don't think that that's an inherent quality in trans women. I think that what uh, you may be seeing and what you may have experienced is that some of the uh, socioeconomic realities lend themselves to a greater dependence to the use of uh, substances uh, in order to be able to participate in you know, the economic realities uh, that they're experiencing. So if they're engaged in sex work, uh, if they're engaged in, you know, lots of times, you know, very severe incidents of discrimination and bias in society, if, particularly if they're not able to successfully transition into the um, gender role that they're comfortable in, um, they may turn to alcohol and drugs in order to be able to cope. And so there's a greater dependence on the substances to help them uh, be able to live their lives. Um, I, I actually feel like there are strategies for addressing some of the resistance to the um, giving up of the substances. Like, for example, if you develop economic empowerment programs where then trans people can uh, participate in the workplace in uh, outside of sex work environments, um, then they're more likely to give up the drug use. But you have to give them options. You have to give them an option outside of uh, the street economy. 
Okay, and I just have one more here, and I'm not sure I'm going to do this correctly. Um, we are permitting, oops, it just, we are permitting our clients to submit UDS unmonitored and will be monitored by body temp. Do you understand that? Um, okay, say that again. I'm sorry. Yeah, I might ask them to. Uh, to I think what they're saying is that they're allowing their clients to submit their own urine samples. That's what it looks like. But they yeah. will be monitored uh, via body temperature instead. Um, well, it sounds like a you know creative um, strategy for uh, obtaining the urine sample and uh, still allowing some privacy. So, if they're able to do it effectively, more power to them. I think it's great. Okay, and I think that that's the end for the comments right now. So, thanks. All right. Sure, great. All right, so let's see here. We'll get back to the uh, presentation. So um, next slide is um, I wanted to just share with you some of the issues around incarceration. Um, and this is a very sad reflection of our society, actually. So, you know, as a result of, you know, the rampant transphobia in our society, uh, transphobia is, I should define that for you, so transphobia is akin to homophobia, but it's specific to transgender identities, and there's an irrational fear of uh, transgender people because of the lack of knowledge or awareness about uh, transgender populations. So, but the transphobia leading to you know the higher rates of sex work and drug use and then leading to um, incarceration and then certainly leading to unprotected sex during incarceration and that you know obviously leads to higher rates of HIV so incarceration rates among trans women in the literature are between 37 to 65 percent um, is what is borne out in the literature. And um, what we've anecdotally and through some of the kind of local um, studies that have been conducted, we see trans women who are um, sometimes arrested for very minor um, infractions. So for example, because they were, um, you know, going to um, to their HIV care provider and were uh, on the street and had condoms in their bag uh, in their in their purse then they're apprehended by the police and then if they have condoms in their bag then they're determined to be uh, engaged in sex work and uh, and arrested apprehended and arrested we see many cases uh, where trans women have been uh, arrested in similar circumstances. Also, um, you know, the over-dependence on the sex work um, as, a, as a survival technique. And so we see lots of trans women uh, ending up in uh, jails and prison uh, as a result of their participation in the sex work environment. Um, and then um, in an LA setting, 15% reported that they had engaged in unprotected sex during incarceration. Um, that's actually, in my opinion, a little low because most jails and prisons in the United States, there are uh, condoms are not made available, and so I, I think that actually most uh, trans people, when they are engaging in uh, sexual activity during uh, their incarceration, uh, will be doing so with um, you know, unprotected um, methods. Um, so the other thing, of course, is that when they're housed, when, when they're incarcerated, trans women uh, are typically in uh, this country housed according to genitalia. So it doesn't matter if the trans woman has, for example, had facial feminization surgery, has had breast augmentation, may have uh, hip implants, may have had you know, um, 
you know, all kinds of body modification um, where they exhibit a female form. But if they have a penis, they're going to end up in a men's facility. And so it's, uh, it, it actually puts trans people at risk to be housed with, um, you know, with a male prison and jail population. And, uh, often trans women have to resort to having a protector when they're behind bars. And um, it creates lots of very, uh, very uh, precarious situations. So this slide really is an attempt by, um, by the COE to kind of just um, summarize all of the uh, factors that I've been sharing with you. Um, the, if you start out from the upper left and you look at the um, housing and job discrimination, and then the internalized transphobia. And I should clarify that. So, um, you know, there are two main uh, impacts from transphobia. One is internalized, and uh, one is external transphobia, so, or societal transphobia. So the societal transphobia is when we're talking about the impacts of the transphobic society. So the lack of employment opportunities, the lack of legal frameworks for trans people to exist in the world, uh, the lack of identity documents, uh, identity documents being made available for for the trans person, the lack of um, you know legal recognition, um, those kinds of things. Then uh, internalized transphobia is when we're talking about trans people who have absorbed all of that negative stimulus from their families, from their peers, from their friends, from their um, schoolmates, from their pastors, and have bought into the notion that there is something inherently wrong with them merely for being transgender. And so that internalized transphobia can really have a huge impact on your self-esteem and on the way that you, uh, you know, see yourself in the world, the the um, the actions that you're willing to take on your own behalf. So, you know, do you care enough about yourself to protect your body uh, when you're being put at risk for HIV? And you know, do you have enough self-worth? Um, you know, do you do you believe that? you know, that you have a life, uh, you know, of value and something to be proud of. And lots of trans people really, really struggle with this because they bought into this negative stimulus that they've received from society. And we call that internalized transphobia. Um, now, uh, as I've tried to demonstrate um, during this talk, um, that transphobia in all of its ways, in all of its forms, leads to the increased use of drugs as a coping mechanism, which then impacts the mental health status and leads to higher rates of unprotected sex. Um, I apologize for the numbers that are here. You won't have those numbers. Those are references that I've used in another presentation. So I apologize that I left the numbers in here. They're I hope they, they don't confuse you. Just disregard the numbers. So um, then um, the next quarter there where it says prison and jail, so that leading the, you know, the transphobia and the drug use leading to higher rates of um, prison and or jail or incarcerated or being incarcerated. And then, um, you know, the sex work and um, all of the various reasons why transgender people depend on sex work. Now, I, d I haven't really talked too much about the gender affirmation uh, notion of sex work, but many trans people do in fact report that um, engaging in sex work industry is actually one way in which they do receive some affirmation for their gender identities. So 
you know, what I've heard trans women say in particular is that there's nothing more that makes, you know, you feel like a woman than for some, a man to be telling you that you look beautiful and that they're willing to pay you $100 to have sex with you. Um, I would argue that there are other ways to receive gender affirmation, but I think that, you know, this is what is reported in the literature, that many trans women do depend on that affirmation of their gender through sex work clients who, um, who pursue them and who do provide some, you know, complimentary um, comments. Now, what happens as a result of all this HIV is that transgender women living with HIV are less likely to receive good care. Um, so in a study of four U.S. cities, uh, it was found that transgender women living with HIV were less likely to receive highly active antiretroviral therapy than a non-transgender control group, 59% versus 82%. Now, why would that be the case? For, you know, for a variety of reasons. One of them is that uh, lots of providers are not uh, prepared to provide care for transgender people. They find them, uh, sometimes uh, we've seen in the literature that providers report transgender people to be difficult to deal with. And my answer to that is that if you have just, you know, had to fight your way through a city bus or through a rough neighborhood uh, and, you know, been insulted on the way to get to a clinic appointment and uh, that once you get to the clinic appointment that, um, you know, the front desk person called you sir when you were dressed as female or calls out, you know, your name uh, in a crowded um, waiting room and uses your, your male or legal name, um, that, you know, by the time that you do get to see a provider, you're not going to be in the best mood, um, or you may be agitated, and um, you may, you know, exhibit some resentment of the system that has made you feel this way. So I think, um, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind, is that uh, trans people, are like no other population in that they have to really struggle and, and you know, challenge themselves in order to show up, be on time, and then be engaged. Um, and then by the time they do get to see a provider, the provider is often ill-equipped to, to care for their needs. They may uh, understand uh, HIV treatment, but they may not have uh, been able to uh, educate themselves around provision of cross-gender hormones, for example. And so the, the, um, the goal of the transgender patient may be different than that of their HIV care provider. And so I think um, those are all things to think about when you're um, delivering care for, for transgender populations. So what happens? I wanted to share with you this, these slides because I think this is uh, a good um, example of some of that kind of bias that is experienced in medical uh, sites. So um, this is uh, from the San Francisco Department of Public Health website and from a report that they conducted. Um, and uh, this slide shows some transgender epidemiology. Now, San Francisco is one of the few cities and counties that actually has been tracking transgender data for years. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to live in, uh, to work in the city of, of San Francisco, so I have access to these slides. So, here's what they found, is that consistently between 2004 and 8, transgender people represented at least 2% of the newly diagnosed AIDS cases in San Francisco. You can see here that um, now the one thing to keep in mind is that at least in San Francisco, the numbers here or the percentages, even though the gender being reported here is male, female, transgender, all of these cases are in fact transgender women. 
I did confirm this with the county. So these are all transgender women, and you can see that uh, you know every year except for 2007 when there was a spike, it's been two percent of the reported cases. Um, and then in 2007 we have that four percent. Um, so I'm not sure what uh, that was about, but at least two percent of the cases have been transgender. And then here, this is a figure showing a Kaplan-Meier survival curve for persons diagnosed with AIDS between 96 and 2008 by gender in San Francisco. And the survival curves for persons diagnosed with AIDS between 96 and 2008 show an extreme drop-off for transgender people. So you can follow here the red line on the graph are transgender uh, people. And then the blue line is, are males. And then the green line are non-transgender females. So you can see here that um, for transgender people at about 150 months post-diagnoses, the survival rates dropped to about 30% compared to males uh, surviving at about a 62% rate and females surviving about a 47% rate. But you can see the clear differences here in survival rates for transgender women and we're talking about a place that is renowned throughout the country for the care that has been made available for transgender people. So for me, this is a very you know, sad and telling uh, data. Because if we in San Francisco can't get it right and can't get transgender people into care and then extend their survival, then what is happening in the rest of the country? What is happening in places like um, Bakersfield or um, you know, in, the, in the Central Valley of California or what's happening in places like uh, Oklahoma or you know, any other range of places that um, might not be as you know, what we consider to be progressive thinking as a place like San Francisco where um, trans people have, in fact, been part of the landscape for quite a while. So this is another um, slide showing uh, San Francisco County trans epidemiology. And so, again, although between 2004 and 8, transgender people represented 2% of the newly diagnosed AIDS cases, in 2008, they represented 7% of the total deaths. So again, just demonstrating the dis extreme disparities that are being experienced by trans people who are um, actually you know, known to have HIV and are part of the public health system. If they're doing this poorly, then what about you know, that, um, that huge number of trans people who don't know their HIV status? What, what don't we know about them? So um, at this point, I think I would like to open it up for another um, poll question that we developed on discrimination. So uh, Christine, could you open up the poll? Um, yes, I have the poll up. It's uh, in the U.S. transgender are protected from discrimination on the basis of their sexual identity. True, false. And then um, do you feel that it's true in approximately half the states, in 13 states or 31 states, if you pick the, the true option? So please um, participate in that poll. And in the meantime, I have a couple uh, questions here. One is um, regarding uh, the VA. And it says, in VA, uh, the treatment took a long time uh, to give women um, 
uh, a maternity ward, say, or give women treatment, and they say the VA won't allow the sexual uh, replacement surgery by VA staff or by an outside surgeon. Um, they're call HMOs ca are calling it cosmetic surgery. And they say that hormone treatment and mental health are available, though. Do you have any comment on that? Um, the only comment that I have is that the VA policies are being um, revised as we speak. If uh, I know that the VA is in um, consultation with the National Center for Transgender Equality and the National Coalition for LGBT Health and the task force, the Gay and Lesbian Task Force in Washington, D.C., all, you know, pretty large advocacy organizations. And so, um, my sense is that actually uh, the VA and you know and beyond Health and Human Services actually uh, are all working very hard to address uh, the you know issue of providing care for transgender population. Um, I I I I feel like certain VAs in the United States, certain VA hospitals in the United States are. Um, further along in terms of providing care for their transgender patients. Uh, I know that in San Francisco, uh, the VA is quite uh, far along in actually providing pretty good care. They, um, you know, they, in fact, there's a transgender woman uh, who is uh, a licensed therapist, and she was working at the VA and providing uh, mental health services for uh, transgender uh, veterans. And um, they have actually contracted with the Center of Excellence on several occasions to have us come out and to uh, uh, engage in some provider training for, uh, for clinicians who are serving the needs of transgender veterans in, at that particular VA. But the national policy is, uh, you know, under review currently, and I know that there is a commitment from the administration to move that forward. So, in terms of the surgery, I can't really speak to the specifics of uh, you know what the VA will end up including. Um, you know, I, I have not yet seen the final policy. Okay, um, we have. We'll close the poll now. So, uh, and I will share the results. Um, let's see, 40% thought that the statement is true, that U.S. transgender are protected from discrimination on the base of their gender identity. 31% uh, said false. Um, of the ones, people that said true, they said 9% uh, said that it was true for half of the states. 37 thought that it was, 37% I uh, think that it's true in 13 of the states, and 6% think it's true in 31 states. Mm -hmm. So the correct answer is that transgender people are protected on the basis of their gender identity in 13 states. And so uh, we don't have uh, any national laws that protect transgender people on the basis of gender identity. Uh, we do have some movement forward in this area. For example, um, you know, the, um, the Health and Human Services has, um, has issued some uh, policy briefs on uh, transgender people having access to uh, health. And so the uh, Health and Human Services Secretary is, uh, is advocating for, you know, full uh, access, um, and we know that um, that you know the the president's um, uh, representatives are in fact uh, attempting to address transgender um, discrimination and coming up with policies to to counter the the evidence of discrimination. But uh, currently, there is no legal uh, recourse for transgender people that is a federal law. And 13 states, as I said, do have, um, you know, in, in their uh, state constitutions that you cannot discriminate on the basis of gender identity. If you're interested in, um, you know, knowing what those states are, I'd be happy to send you the, the slides 
uh, the slide with with the particular states that, that do have those protections. Okay, and I have, uh, I think, two more comments here. Um, let's see, low self-esteem issues play an important role in the transgender population because they are constantly abused by people who don't understand them. In the substance of abuse field, some counselors are confused about how to deal with their own bias and how to become more open-minded. How can we deal with our own bias and better help the transgender population? Um, well, I think that um, first, the first step is really recognizing your own bias, and I think that that is, you know, that's the important first step. You don't, if you don't acknowledge that you have an issue, then you know, then the issue is not real for you. So acknowledge that you have the issue, and then seek clinical supervision to address, you know, what those bias are and, you know, how they're playing themselves out. I think that, um, you know, like any other field, people who are, for example, if you're going to provide diabetes care or if you're going to, you know, provide, um, you know, hospice or any other kind of specialized uh, care, you need to educate yourself about the um, the issue, and I think that education does address a lot of the bias. Now, if you find that even with becoming aware that you do have, you know, internalized bias, and then seeking out clinical supervision and seeking out educational opportunities, you find that you cannot get past your bias, then my recommendation is to remove yourself from the, from the treatment setting because you know, if you cannot work past the bias, then you're not going to be able to provide good care. You may do more harm than good. So, um, so that, those are the steps that I would recommend. Is you know, first do a, a good self-assessment, then you know, seek support, educate yourself, and then if all else fails, remove yourself from it. Um, as a follow-up to that, um, another attendee said, in terms of counselor training, in addition to formal training and supervision, what do you think of the idea of encouraging substance abuse and mental health counselors to attend annual Transgender Day of Remembrance event? You know, I think that the annual Transgender Day of Remembrance events uh, serve a good purpose to remind people about, um, you know, the huge disparities that um, are experienced by transgender people and the um, prevalence of violence in this community. I, myself, uh, feel that they are not um, the best uh, tool for educating about, um, you know, care issues, uh, access to care issues. Uh, you know, uh, treatment methodologies, et cetera, because those are, that's not the focus of those events. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is, you know, if, if, you, if you want to support the community by participating in Day of Remembrance events, I think that's all fine and good, and I appreciate your support. I think that if you want to educate yourself about providing good care, then seek out educational opportunities where that is the focus. And there are more and more such training opportunities being made available, including um, venues such as what we're engaged in today, but also in-person uh, trainings. For example, next I, I think it's next month or maybe in June, there's a pretty large transgender uh, conference that will take place in Philadelphia that is uh, put on by the Mazzoni Center the Trans Health Conference. So that would be an opportunity to go and educate yourself on um, you know, good practices for transgender care. Um, there, my understanding is that there will be a three-day CME um, uh, event prior to, uh, to the conference itself, which is you know, in large part uh, aimed at trans community itself. But there will be a three-day CME event that's targeting providers uh, also with that conference. Also, um, the transgender, uh, the National Transgender Health Summit, we launched the National Transgender Health Summit at the Center of Excellence 
last year, April 2011, we had um, that was our inaugural event. We had 400 people attend, and we expect to have the second National Transgender Health Summit occur uh, in the spring of 2013. Um, the other organization that has, uh, you know, pretty large training events are the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. They have a biannual um, provider meeting, um, and uh, the next, this is a global organization. So uh, the last uh, meeting took place in Atlanta, Georgia in 2011, and the next one is going to happen actually in Bangkok in uh, Thailand. Um, but, you know, you might look on their website to see if they're doing anything locally um, or in the Northeast. So, you know, those are just a few um, options. I think GLAMA, uh, Gay and Lesbian Medical Association, they're also um, attempting to create uh, training programs for transgender healthcare needs. And there are other organizations such as that um, that I would encourage you to, to you know, look up and, and see if there are educational programs that you can participate in. Um, somebody said that I work in the methadone field. I noticed that a lot of counselors need to be more sensitive with the transgender population. Um, and annual training requirements uh, would be the best thing, but um, they feel the dependence field needs to improve their training in sexual education. Um, why do you think that there's not a lot of that available? You know, um, it seems to me that the accrediting body, uh, you know, comes up with the, the criteria and there has to be advocacy from the practitioners in the field in order to include um, the, you know, these issues in the criteria. So I, I can't really speak to, uh, to the process myself. I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm... I'm not a member of one of those accrediting bodies, so you know I, I I couldn't speak to the specifics. But it seems to me that if there were um, providers, um, if if there were substance abuse treatment providers that were advocating for you know for this uh, inclusion in the accrediting um, of uh, of their peers, then uh, it stands a better chance of being included. So I think it's a great idea, and um, you know, put it forth to you know to the licensing body in your state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good idea. Um, okay, here's another one. Uh, women in prison are not provided with any kind of condoms, particularly in federal prison. And do you know the reason for that? Um, the systems, the system knows that they are as sexually active as well as men, can we consider it another kind of punishment? Well, I think the one thing I tried to make this clear is that condoms are not distributed in prisons for men or for women. So, you know, yes, I think it's another, you know, it's a misguided um, policy, um, you know, it's in most states it's a crime to engage in sexual activity while you're incarcerated or in prison, but the, re the human condition calls for, you know, sexual behavior to take place, I mean, you know, it's just a fact of life, and so um, it's, it's a very misguided policy not to provide, um, you know, condoms to people in, in correctional settings. Now, having said that, I think that, you know, in, in male prisons where the majority of trans women are going to be housed, unless they've had vaginoplasty, unless they've had some kind of general um, gender confirmation surgery, um, if they have a penis, they're going to end up in a male facility. And so it seems to me that, you know, that um, the, the greater HIV risk is 
going to be uh, within those male prisons. And so um, I would advocate for, you know, for issuance of, um, you know, prophylactics in all prisons that if, um, you know, if there needed to be a priority, uh, then I would ad advocate for provision of, of condoms uh, in, in male facilities because, you know, that's where there is, um, you know, penetrative sex taking place with, uh, with a penis and where HIV is being spread. Uh, in, in fact, this next comment uh, leads exactly uh, into the, the comments you were just making. It says, given mm -hmm. the number of trans, trans persons involved in the criminal justice system, education for these providers would also be helpful, especially correction staff, as this environment is gender divided and this poses a challenge with transgender persons. Well, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yes, absolutely. We need to do a much better job of educating correctional staff. And, you know, the, 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 one of the challenges, of course, is that there's, uh, like any other, you know, high-stress work environments, there's high turnover of correctional staff. And so um, it's, you know, it's not just educating uh, correctional staff who are in a facility at any given day, but you know, making sure that there's routine training made available for for the staff and for the associated personnel as well, because um, often we can get through to the healthcare providers that are based in criminal justice environments, but um, the correctional staff themselves, the sheriff's department, the other correctional officers. They're the ones that, uh, you know, are going to have much more control over the transgender inmates. And so they, they need, um, you know, the education and, and the, the vetting of the information. There are some uh, places that are doing, you know, a much better job of this than others. And actually, um, in the state of California, for example, there is, uh, you know, there are a couple people who have been doing pretty great work at the at the state level to, uh, in order to ensure that trans people have, you know, competent quality care available, uh, made available to them. Um, and so, you know, cross-sex hormone therapy is available for transgender inmates who have um, already begun uh, the, the transition process prior to incarceration. And so if you know, if they're on hormones when they go in, when, when they become incarcerated, then, you know, they're allowed to continue the use of the hormone therapy and, um, and have access to that. And then actually, recently, um, they, um, they started making available to transgender women in uh, prison facilities bras uh, because, you know, obviously, if um, if trans women are housed in a male segregated facility and they're being provided with cross-sex hormone therapy and developing breasts or, you know, continuing with, uh, you know, with um, the breast development that they had prior to incarceration, then they need access to, you know, to bras in order to, um, you know, maintain the health of their breasts. So, um, so that is, you know, a recent development at California prison systems. And I think that, you know, there's lots of groups that are doing advocacy at the prison or correctional setting. Um, if you're particularly interested in this area, actually the, the groups that I would recommend you look up are uh, Transgenders in Prison Project, this TGIP. Um, they're a group out of San Francisco. Uh, and then there's also Lambda Legal does a lot of work, and the Sylvia Rivera Law Project in uh, New York City. Um, and so those are the ones that I would recommend. Um, oh, actually, also the National Center for Transgender Equality, NCTE, um, they're based in Washington, D.C., and they've done some work on um, trans people in correctional settings as well, as, as, along with us, of course. You can, you know, find a lot of information on our website. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's it for now. Do you have more slides at this point? I do have some, a couple more slides. Okay, let's go through those then. Yeah, I'll go through the slides. Okay. So here are, I, I just wanted to share with you a couple of barriers and facilitators to program implementation. So one of them is around, um, you know, obviously adequate funding. And so, you know, all of that data collection information that I shared with you in the beginning uh, does impact the development of programs. So unless you're adequately capturing transgender data and you have a sense of how many people are in your community, then there are not going to be funds made available to provide for those needs. If, you know, if you're not counted, then you don't count and then the programs are not developed to respond to your needs. So encourage data collection because that's the only way that you're going to get the funds to do this work. Um, community involvement in program development is important. I shared with you early on that we have a very involved and engaged um, National Advisory Board, and I think that that is really important. Trans people need to be, um, you know, uh, at every step of the program development. Um, and then hire trans staff at all levels if you're able to. Um, I think that, uh, you know, trans people are um, a resilient uh, population and um, will um, contribute in the workplace if given a chance and so and are talented often and uh, come with skills that perhaps they've not been able to apply because of discrimination but if given a chance then they will do an effective job and then of course assurance of privacy is very important for trans people um, so that they um, are made to feel safe and uh, trust that their employer and or their care provider is not going to be disclosing, um, you know, issues that they hold private. I think another challenge is the transience of transgender clients. Often, you know, as a result of you know the high degree of poverty rates and um, the inability to maintain a steady housing. Uh, you know, the clients are, are transient and so uh, it can be challenging to develop programs and then not know, you know, if the clients that you're serving today are going to be there tomorrow. Um, then all of the uh, various needs of a very diverse community and how to best um, respond to those diverse needs. Um, the fact that so many trans people will avoid services due to past experiences of stigma and discrimination. And then of course, you know, keeping in mind that for people who are taking plus gender hormones, that that not be an, uh, an optional service. Um, you know, this is a very important component of, um, of transgender health. And if the person has sought out medical transition, then um, you know, in substance abuse treatment facilities, we need to be able to respond to that need to sustain uh, their uh, gender identity and gender expression. And then in terms of asking sensitive questions, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, lots of times providers are very uh, reluctant to uh, ask these types of questions and um, or they're or they ask questions that maybe they haven't really completely thought through. For example, um, a question that a lot of people ask of transgender people are, are you going to have surgery? Or another question that they might ask is, gosh, they, they may frame it in the form of a compliment. That they may say, gosh, you look so good. When did you have surgery? And, or when did you have the surgery? Um, all of those surgery questions are examples in my mind of um, a question that is really loaded and I question whether uh, it has utility. So is the question necessary or are you just asking it for your own curiosity and thus not appropriate? 
When you're asking about surgery or surgery status or intent, what you're basically asking of the transgender person is you're asking them to disclose to you the state of their genitalia. And it's not a question that, um, you know, typically we would ask of one another unless there was some intent for ha or purpose for having that information. So if you have already gone through and revised your intake processes and you have the two-step data collection method integrated into your intake, then you should know that the person is trans-identified. And then if you are providing a residential um, you know, environment or if you're overseeing a residential environment and you need to know what genitalia the person has, then you can ask about genitalia. But, um, you know, keep in mind that whatever question you're asking, you should base on what is it that you need to know, what do you already know, what do you need to know, and then how do you ask it in a sensitive way. This is, you know, this isn't rocket science. This is just common sense kind of, um, you know, thinking through how are you going to ask these questions that, for trans people are really loaded. And then in terms of pronouns, what I always advise is, um, you know, if you are confused, then, you know, don't sweat it. If you are confused, then it may be the case, it probably is the case, that other people have been confused before you with this individual. So, Politely ask. Own your own confusion. You know, be honest about it. Share your confusion. Say, you know, I'm sorry. You know, I hope that this doesn't offend you. I just want to make sure that I'm providing good care or good services for you. And then ask the question. Remember that individual trans people may have a preference of he or she. They may not have a preference, and it's okay to use he or she. And they, or they may prefer that you use a gender neutral pronoun, such as Z. They may prefer that you not use a pronoun and only refer to them by name. So, you know, or to use gender neutral pronouns such as they, um, you know, or something like that. So that you're not, you know, putting the onus on the pronoun. So just let your patient be your guide in that regard. And, um, and, and you'll do fine. But, you know, again, I'm asking you, own your own confusion. Don't put it off on the patient. And then these are just some quick treatment do's and don'ts. So do use proper pronouns. Do get clinical supervision if you have issues or feelings about working with trans individuals. Do allow trans clients to continue the use of hormones. And then if they're using street hormones, then facilitate their, uh, their um, accessing of competent medical care through normal channels. And then do take required training on trans issues. Do, um, do develop a policy in order for trans people to be able to use bathrooms and showers based on their gender self-identities and gender roles. You know, everyone needs to use the bathroom. Everyone needs to shower. You just develop a policy that, you know, keeps safety in mind. Create and maintain a safe environment for all trans clients. Do post a non-discrimination policy that explicitly includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And don't project transphobia onto the trans client. Don't make the trans client choose between hormones of treatment and recovery. Don't make the trans client educate the staff. This is very common and it's very unfair for the trans client who's often no better equipped to educate their own providers than any other person there. So, you know, just because the trans client is uh, the resident doesn't make them an expert on provision of care for transgender people. Don't uh, put them in that role. Um, it's, not a, it's not a good place for them to be. Um, 
don't assume that trans women or men are gay. Trans people have, are just like any other population, are very are quite sexually uh, diverse. And so trans um, women and men may identify as gay, straight, bisexual, or um, you know, non-sexual. And you need to assess what their sexual orientation is if it's relevant to your work. And then uh, don't make trans individuals live in inappropriate gender segregated facilities. There's, um, you know, that's, that's just not uh, good practice. And do, uh, don't allow staff members or clients to make transphobic comments. That's just not acceptable. Uh, and these are some protective factors that you might want to consider. So, you know, family acceptance really helps to alleviate some of the um, negative um, socioeconomic factors. Social support, healthy self-esteem, so coming up with programs that address self-esteem, and then access to competent health care, access to gender-confirming hormone therapy, and community engagement are all considered protective factors. This is a slide that just kind of uh, is, um, this is demonstrating some best practices that we developed at the Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. If you're interested in um, finding out more about these best practices, you can go to our website and you can look at um, a document that we developed called Assessing Progress, Advancing Excellence, um, Providing Care for Transgender People in California. You can see some of these practices are more clearly spelled out. And more importantly than anything, trans people need jobs. It's the greatest intervention um, for substance use and um, HIV. And so um, I encourage you to hire trans people if you uh, are able to, and um, you'll see trans people like the smiling uh, red-haired lady there holding the trans people need jobs sign. And this is my contact information. Um, I'd like to actually thank Christine again for inviting me to come and speak with you today. And I hope that this has been useful. I'm going to um, invite you to visit our website, transhealth.ucsf.edu. Like to invite you to like us on Facebook um, and follow us for uh, new daily information on trans health. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Christine. And I want to thank you, Christine, for all of your help and support. Well, it's a great webinar with a lot of good information on it. I'm going to. Um, I'll just take back the screen so it goes back to the title screen. And um, I want to thank everybody for their questions and comments. Um, I will be sending a follow-up email to all the attendees that will have a CEU order form. It will also have a certificate of attendance for this webinar. And it will have the PowerPoint um, that Joanne Keatley supplied us. So you will have her contact information on there, as well as all the other information she's provided. Um, I think that it is this time. Thank you so much, Joanne. It was wonderful. I didn't get to see this at the other conference that we were at together, so I'm glad I was able to sit on this now. So <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. I am going to um, 